and welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at youtube.com slash cover3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook network. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe, smash that like, and come and join us in the chat. It is Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We are so thrilled to be able to open up the big old bag of mail, where, of course, you can add a future mailbag question by leaving us a five-star review. Put the question in that review. We'll go ahead and throw it in the bag, open it in a future mailbag episode. But also, as we have introduced the live audience to the Cover 3 the environment ecosystem, the family, family, uh, we have loved getting our mailbag questions also from the live audience. Some of you have followed my advice. You jump in here early, youtube.com slash cover three. Jump in the chat. Give us your question. We've already got a handful of them starred and ready for you. Uh, before we jump into those and some headlines, we want to remind you that brackets are back and you can get in the madness today on the CBS Sports app. Run men's and women's pools with friends and enter our Cover 3 Bracket Challenge for a chance to win a new car and trips to the 2024 Final Four. Play today on the CBS Sports app or visit cbssports.com slash play to sign up. No purchase necessary. See terms and rules for details. We've got a QR code on the screen right now. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube and, and you want to be able to... It. I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 945 people signed up for the Cover 3 Bracket Challenge last year. If you were in it last year, congratulations, you're in it again. Just get into the CBS Sports <laughs> on your app and you can go ahead and get ready. You can't fill it out just yet. It's not how it works. But um, we'll be doing plenty of that and also talking some brackets on that Monday show after uh, Selection Sunday. Tom, spring practice underway before we get to the mailbag questions. And um, spring practice is, is getting rolling down in Austin. And the return of Quinn Ewers comes with expectations for Quinn Ewers. The arrival of Arch Manning brings a lot of star power, apparently a lot of lost student IDs. I don't know if you see this, but Arch needs, he's not a wide receiver. He doesn't have sticky hands. He keeps fumbling these uh, student IDs all over the place. But I I was interested to see that Steve Sarkeesian has come out and did not throw a lot of weight behind sophomore Quinn Ewers as the, the QB1. He is doing what is a little bit cliche as all jobs are available, all jobs are open, including the quarterback position. Do you believe that... Steve Sarkeesian is looking at his quarterback room and he sees an even battle. What are your expectations for what will eventually play out at that position? Probably that he sees an even battle. I think you kind of have to. I mean, Arch Manning is a very talented player. Quinn Ewers is a very talented player. I don't think if you're in that situation, I, I think the ideal scenario for if you're Sark is that Quinn Ewers keeps the job and you redshirt Arch for a year, and then Quinn leaves, goes to the NFL, and then Arch takes over. I I wonder, like, there could be, if if Quinn loses the job and Arch gets it from the jump, it could cause kind of a distraction, kind of headache in the locker room and in the media and all that kind of stuff. So ideally, I think he wants viewers to win. I think that's probably the best case scenario. But if they're both as good as everybody thinks they are, and we've only seen flashes from Ewers, he played really well against Alabama last year, got hurt, missed some time, came back, had moments, had bad moments, you know, looked like a freshman quarterback. And with all the hype surrounding Arch Manning as a prospect coming out of high school, the number one recruit in the class, he's clearly talented. So it's a good situation to have, whereas I've got two really good quarterbacks and I've got to try to figure out which one's going to be my starter. But my guess is that Quinn Ewers is probably going to start the season as the number one and then maybe Manning gets some time in early non-conference games and maybe he plays more than four games in red shirts and maybe he doesn't because honestly whether he red shirts or not if Arch Manning is who everybody thinks Arch Manning is he's not going to be here more than three years anyway correct so I don't know if the red shirt matters that much to them so yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting to follow. It's clearly the most interesting, I think, QB battle for, is from a national perspective. I mean, obviously, everybody cares about what's going on at their own schools. But just from the national attention, this is going to be the one that gets the most because of the names, because of what Texas is trying to be, and because of the struggles. And they're trying to, you know, get to the top of the Big 12 before they leave for the SEC. So, yeah, it's it's really interesting to watch. I think Ewers is your favorite. I do not think he's got the job on lockdown because – if, like I said, if Arch Manning is coming in practice and playing well, 
and he's leading the team and he's picking up the playbook and he's doing everything he's supposed to do. And then we get to the season. I mean, Sark's not trying to go seven and five again or eight. Mm-hmm. And four. We've seen Texas. It's, you, you, they, they're waiting for somebody to start winning. And if Sark feels that Arch Manning is the guy who gives them the best chance to win games, Arch Manning's going to be the starting quarterback. Here's my, uh, I think that this is the order of my level of confidence. Number one, I am fairly confident that Steve Sarkeesian is not going to announce a QB1 no. at the end of spring practice. No. We will not get that answer here in this game, in this uh, next several weeks at all. I believe that he will try to <clears throat> allow that competition to remain as 50-50 as possible, if for no other reason than to try and maintain some quarterback depth. Because... He has already seen how quickly things can unravel in terms of your quarterback depth with just a couple of injuries. Mm -hmm. And so you want to make sure that you've got both quarterbacks, whether it is Arch starting and Quinn backing him up or Quinn starting and Arch backing him up. This is going to be at least made, at least going to be believed as late as you possibly can without impacting the team's preparation for week one, that it's going to be a battle. And I think that that's something that you just have to do in the modern, you know, college football quarterback coaching world. I am also fairly confident that no matter what, Arch Manning will play against Rice on September 2nd, 2023. And if he does anything that looks amazing, life is going to be tough on Quinn Ewers. Did you make anything of the haircut? Steve, Steve Sarkeesian, you know, he says that Quinn's always been a very serious guy, but you know, quote, all of a sudden, now the guy gets a haircut, cleans up his beard a little bit, and everybody thinks Quinn's real serious right now. That's human nature. It's never been a question of him taking this serious. He wants to be really good. He wants to be a leader on this team. He wants to win a championship with these guys, and that doesn't change what he does day to day, but the appearance is what it is. And so I do think him recognizing that shows some maturity. Listen dumb football guy brain when we first like back in the days when barton was still on the show when quinn ewers was a high school prospect and you and i first came across him through barton and we saw the photo of him what was the first thing i said there's no way this kid could be any good with a haircut like that there's just (laughs) simply no way i'm gonna take this kid seriously and barton was like no he's he's really good and barton was right he is very talented but yeah (laughs) it doesn't matter but it does matter like i Yes, he looks he looks more serious. And I think honestly, perception is a big part of reality. And I think that for if people start viewing it that way, just for him, whether it actually makes a difference on the field, probably not. Right. But the way people perceive him, I mean, if he's trying to get ready for the NFL, look at some of the things NFL teams like knock quarterbacks or any prospect on when they're in the evaluation process that mullet that would be a red flag on somebody's draft board like i don't know he just doesn't he doesn't take things seriously he's a party kid he's going to you know it's like he, he kid might not have ever have ever had a beer in his life but you have a haircut like that everybody thinks you're going to the keggers every single weekend and having a good time so it's it has absolutely no impact on his play but i think it's important because i'm an idiot and that's how everybody thinks Well, it's like, do you care more about if you are Quinn Ewers and you get the impression that other people will take you more seriously if you cut your hair? Do you care more about your hair or do you care about people taking you seriously? And if you're trying to be the starting quarterback, the leader in the locker room of Texas football, you got to care what other people think. So dress for the job you want. Hey, not for the one you have. And so, I'm wearing a hoodie. So you guys in hoodies. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> here's, the podcast. here's kind of just a fun hypothetical just to see. I don't think this is what happens, but let's say Arch Manning wins the job out of, you know, summer camp and into the fall. Does Quinn transfer again or does he just go to the NFL? Like he would have to transfer again, right? I don't think like anybody's drafting him off of three or four, you know, like a half a season of, of play. Oh, he might. Is He will be draft eligible after the 2023 yeah. season if he's riding the bench. Would he transfer again, come back to college for a 2024 season elsewhere? At which point, since he's already transferred, I think he would have need to wrap up that undergraduate degree yeah. to be immediately eligible for 2024, having already used the one-time transfer waiver. I could be wrong on the details of that. For, uh, please forgive me if that's so. I think that given his projection and given the tools, what he has shown in limited ability, even if he was the backup, I think he could still get drafted. I think he could get drafted, but would he be a first-round pick? Mm. I 
doubt it very much. If I am Steve Sarkeesian, I hope that Quinn Ewers raises his level of play so that he wins the job and I don't have to send Arch Manning into Tuscaloosa to play Alabama in week two. Just awesome. feels like such a pivot point in in this whole, you know, what we're going to do with the Texas quarterbacks battle. Also, it's just good for Sark long term in that at Alabama, he helped Tua and Mac Jones become first round picks. If he takes Quinn Ewers and develops him, he plays well and develops him into a first round pick. And then he's got Arch Manning. It's going to make quarterback recruiting very easy at Texas over the next few years. Aside from Alabama, the other non-cons are Rice and Wyoming, both those games in Austin. Uh, the, as the conference schedule unfolds, you go road to Baylor you know, on September 23rd, followed by Kansas, then the Red River game against Oklahoma. And again, this is a Big 12 conference game at Houston. Is a Big 12 conference game, Texas at Houston on October 21st. You know, there um, are like 69 Power 5 teams now. I got to keep reminding myself of that. 69 Power 5 teams, nice. 69, 69, power, 69, 69 power 5. Nice, All right. Nice, nice, nice. You think we'll be able to remember that? I don't know. It's just, <laughs> it's such a, it's a hard number to remember. Nobody ever mentions it. Um, any news on Wednesday morning that Josh Gaddis, I mean, th I'm trying to wrap up. Uh, uh, a Miami football spring feature. So Josh Gaddis has definitely bring, been on the brain for me recently. Hooray. Uh, but Josh Gaddis has arrived and, and has been introduced as a co-offensive coordinator at Maryland for Mike Loxley. You know, this is a, a series of, of high profile. He's offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, uh, Josh Gaddis. It, also, we've got Kevin Sumlin as a tight ends coach. Mike Loxley is, uh, you know, we've, we get some... Um, we we got some Maryland fans that want us to talk more Maryland, so I'll, I'll I'll give you a little bit here because I think that Josh Gaddis and Kevin Sumlin arriving at Maryland shows me that Mike Loxley is able has the um, belief from the the school to be able to go out there and put together identify talented coaches who he has worked with or who he has been peers with and be able to put together a staff and I think that that's what happens when. You win, finish back-to-back -back seasons with bowl wins. I think that's what happens when you win eight games for the first time in like nearly two decades. I think that as we look at Maryland football, the first thing out of our mouth is how tough it is to be in the same division as Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, and Michi Michigan State. And yet when we go into a potentially future divisionless world, what Mike Loxley has been able to do over his four seasons in College Park kind of gives me confidence if I'm a Maryland fan that we're not going to fall to like the basement of the conference, that the infrastructure that we've got here is pretty good. Yeah. Like, I mean, long-term, if you're a Maryland fan, getting rid of the divisions, you feel like will make things easier. It doesn't mean Maryland's going to be a top, like you said, a top third program in the big 10, but it'll definitely make the pathway to having good seasons easier. Um, Well, Mike Loxley came from Alabama after you know struggling as a head coach at New Mexico, he went to the Nick Saban School for Wayward Coaches, learned all of Saban's ways, and now he's gone to Maryland and he's opening his own school for wayward coaches, bringing Sumlin and bringing in Gaddis, who has been you know won the Broyles Award at Michigan as offensive coordinator, goes to Miami and is only there for a year before you know he's shown the door and like I whatever it is, I just hope that if Josh is the co-offensive coordinator, Locks lets him coordinate the offense like let's see it because i don't think we've seen gaddis really able to do what he's wanted to do at either of his last two stops so will we finally get to see it or is this going to be more of a you know is the co-offensive coordinator role like you see it in a lot of coaching staffs like who's there's it's sometimes it's by committee sometimes it's the head coach still calling the plays i don't know what the situation is going to be at maryland mike loxley has plenty of play calling experience in his past as a coach. He was a very successful play caller. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I, I think it's always good to have that amount of experience on your staff though. It's like, it clearly works for Alabama. Maybe it'll work for locks. Yep. Very interesting to uh, to keep tabs on as uh, as Loxley enters the 2023 season with some, uh, some good momentum that he has built up there in college park. Coming up on the other side, we go into the big old bag of mail. Well, looking at Kirby Smart, because Kirby Smart just won a second national championship. Are the next couple of years going to be more Nick Saban, more championships to come, or Dabo Sweeney? We'll get into that and more next. Oh, what do you think we're going to uncover out there? With some luck, maybe a green jacket as sharp as the one you get when you win the Masters. It's a tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. 
back here. On... I, was, I didn't see that coming. It's, I, I love um, th those who are watching on YouTube, youtube.com slash cover three, just got to see one of what is a, a series of very, very funny and well done promos for the masters that uh, the, the good folks at the, the CBS primetime lineup have, uh, have put together. Do you remember the like the soap opera talking about March Madness that they had last year? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So they got they're in their bag. It's a, it's a good move. I liked it. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and jump into the big old bag of mail. A reminder that if you would like to add a mailbag question to a future mailbag episode, one way to do it is to leave us a five star review. And in that review, go ahead and put your question. This one is from D Ham. It says, does Kirby's next eight years look like a Nick Saban run? Parentheses, multiple championships, continues to recruit in the top three annually. Or more like Dabo Sweeney, parentheses, already peaked with two natties, real good, but not quite championship level anymore. There's two ways. I mean, the thing about this question is the far more likely in a realistic scenario is that it's going to be more like Dabo because of what Saban did at Alabama is very hard to do. Like, it's the greatest college football dynasty we've ever seen in the sport so can he repeat that yeah sure why not but i do feel like it is more likely that georgia is on an alabama path than the clemson path simply because georgia's been recruiting at that level for a while clemson even while it was winning the national titles was not recruiting at like a top three level it was recruiting well and it was developing well and it was coaching well and it had two outstanding quarterbacks that went on to be first round picks that helped him win those national titles. But Clemson has never been the, you know, number one, number two, number three recruiting class on a regular basis. Georgia is. So the talent is going to keep coming. So I think that in an expanded playoff, Georgia is going to be in the playoff probably every year. So it's more likely to have an Alabama outcome from that aspect than it does a Clemson outcome where Clemson's in the playoff every year, but at this point, well, they were, but they haven't been lately, and they're not really looked at right now as a national title contender. Like, they're looked at the ACC champion, but when we really break it down, nobody thinks Clemson's winning a national title anytime soon. So, yes. well, I mean, it's, it's crazy. They won 29 straight games. Yeah. <laughs> Clemson football won 29 consecutive games, won two national championships in a three-year span. But this we're heading into 2023, and that last national championship was 2018. And you mentioned like they did get back and they won the ACC last year. That was nice to be able to get back there. But you know, falling short in 2020 and 2019 in the title game, and 2020 in the semifinals. In 2021, not even making the ACC championship game, and then in 2022, you know, showing up in the Orange Bowl, but you know, get taking that loss to a Hendon Hooker-less Tennessee team, there is undoubtedly a, a step back that has had, and that's really what like has spurred a lot of the changes and a lot of the, you know, Clemson belief that they're about to turn things around and get back to where they they thought they were going to be. But to answer the question, it is more likely that Georgia, a team that has a talent machine, like a team that is arguably under-delivered given its resource and recruiting advantages for a long time, that, you know, it is now reached the top. I don't think it'll be six championships in 12 years, though. No, and I think another part of that you got to consider, too, is the approach, not just from the recruiting aspect of it, but... Like Dabo looks at Clemson and his program and says, we can win national titles. We have won national titles. We want to win national titles. I don't think winning the national title is the end all be all of what Dabo wants to do at Clemson. Whereas when you look at Georgia, like the goal is win the national title. Like everything else is kind of like winning the SEC is great, but if they don't win the national title, the SEC title is all right, cool. Well, we were SEC champs, so we didn't finish the job. So I think just from that kind of approach, Dabo, if his team goes 11 and two and reaches the college football playoff and they don't win it, but his kids are all good kids and they go on to be good boys and graduate. I think that would make, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it might be corny, but I don't think winning the title is Dabo's primary goal. It's just something he wants to do. Uh, let's go ahead and start taking questions from the live audience. Go ahead and uh, throw them in there. 
Uh, let's see. Hey guys, love the pod. I'm excited for Ryan Walters, but it's been well documented. Purdue generally does not hire defensive head coordinators. That's true. It's been like 40 years since they've had a head coach hire who came from the defensive side of the ball. What do you guys think of the Graham Harrell hire and a Hudson card led offense? I like Hudson card quite a bit. I think Hudson card is a good quarterback. I think Hudson card will be a good fit in that offense. I'm not as enthused about Graham Harrell. I feel like Graham Harrell is a name that we've heard a lot as far as like potential. And he's had gotten a lot of big jobs based off being part of that air raid tree. But the results really haven't been there. Like at USC, they they had, you know, did they go 10 and 3 the year he was an OC or was he not there that year with Sam Darnold? I can't no, remember. No, he was not. Okay. He was after that. That was when yeah. he was like his his first sort of like, okay, we're going to take him seriously as a coach on the rise was, was when Keenan he was Slovis. North, it was at North Texas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like he started there, but then he came to USC and he was with the JT Daniels, Kadon Slovis kind of pairing there. It was post Darnold. Yeah, 2019 is his first uh 2019 is his first season as an assistant at USC. Yeah, the result so like it's not to say that they can't be there, but it's just we haven't really seen the results at this point. And Harrell, I thought, was a much like a hyped kind of offensive coordinator on the come up, and we just haven't really seen him hit reach the expectations that were placed on. Doesn't mean it's not gonna work. It's just I don't know, we'll see. But I do think that Harrell's approach is important for Ryan Walters to get at Purdue because the, the basis of the question is, you know, Purdue doesn't hire defensive head coaches and they have been like the air raid team of the big 10 for a very long time. Going back to when Drew Brees was playing quarterback for the Boilermakers and then Kyle Orton followed him. That's been their identity. So I think it's important for the, you know, with a new defensive quote minded head coach coming in who by the way, played quarterback in high school and stuff, but like, to have that, to keep that kind of air raid DNA in the program, I think is important. So it can work because they've got the personnel for it. Everything's kind of already in place there. So I just don't think of Graham Harrell as, I think the shines kind of come off a bit. It doesn't mean he's not any good or it's the offense is going to be as good. It's just, I'm more excited about Hudson card than Graham Harrell, which is probably the short version of that answer. Yeah. I mean, to me, the like super, uh, the super simplified version is that when a defensive coordinator takes a head coaching job, there is a fear among fans that he's going to coach the team like a defensive coordinator. And when you make the philosophical and stylistic hire of Graham Harrell, you're at least indicating now, whether you'll put the clamps on him or, you know, whether he'll be able to totally run the show, we'll see, but you're at least indicating that you, you have plans of being able to go out there and field an offense. that's going to be explosive. That's going to play with some tempo and that is uh, is not going to be afraid to chuck it around just a little bit. Thank you for that question. What's uh? Do you have you done any uh, NFL draft Aiden O'Connell type talk? Uh, I haven't done much talk on it. No, I heard. I believe it was Rick Spielman with uh, with Ryan Wilson. Uh, you know they do phenomenal work uh, with the First Pick podcast. Go and check it out for a lot of NFL draft talk. I think that it was Rick who threw him out as like late you know late round quarterback like guy mm -hmm. who nfl teams are going to end up falling in love with does that jive with sort of your evaluation yeah. of watching him uh yeah i think that he's a guy who i don't i think if aiden o'connell is your starting quarterback in the nfl you're probably oh. going to be you're, you're not going to be competing for a playoff berth but i do think that he is going to be a backup in the nfl and somebody who could maybe start a game or two for you when you need him because it's like you see in the nfl now They've, they're playing an extra game every single year. Nobody's getting through the season without a quarterback injury at some point. So it's important to have a backup who can come in and do the job. And I think for the right teams, for Aiden O'Connell's strengths, yeah, he's going to be playing on an NFL roster next year. All right, this next question, we're going back to the big old bag of mail, uh, comes from user Boilermaker21. Hey guys, been listening to the pod since 2020 and love every episode. Wanted to drop a mailbag question in here. You guys did a good analysis of what the point spread would be if Georgia played the worst NFL team. Now, what would the line look like if Georgia played one of these XFL teams? Which team would have more NFL caliber players, Georgia or one of these XFL teams? 
Thanks for the quality content all year round and go boilers. <laughs> I don't know. Have you watched any XFL games? Not since that very first weekend where I was at a sports bar and there were also games on. So I'm this not, year or last year? <laughs> no, 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 no. Like it was when that uh the Carolina Hurricane Stadium series game against the Caps was ah, on. And okay. I like went to the sport like local sports bar to watch it with some friends and other TVs had the XFL games. The the joke here is well, does the XFL team have a sleeper agent who's leaking the plays to Georgia? Because if so, I would say Georgia minus 13 and a half. Yeah, I don't even know who they're on these rosters. So um I, it would not be nearly as much as the NFL team. Would, would you still say, favor XFL? No, I don't know. I think I'd be a pick them. I don't. That's the. I don't. I can't. I don't know a roster of a single XFL team. I can't tell you who are the quarterbacks in this league. Chad hey, McCarron. Okay. Um. Quentin Flowers. Okay. Uh, Georgia. I would favor Georgia. I mean, you you know what it is like. Quarterbacks might be all right, receivers might be all right. Line Still, of scrimmage is advantage. Line of scrimmage. I don't know if the XFL is going to have the advantage over Georgia. Ben DiNucci is going to be running for his life out there. Yeah, like I think Georgia could beat up an X. I, again, not even knowing who are on these teams, my gut tells me Georgia could beat up an XFL team on the on the line of scrimmage. Oh, this so, is cold. Cold blooded from Georgia. If I mean from Joe in the live chat, half of Georgia's team will play in the NFL. Zero of the XFL players will. Cruel. I do. That's cruel. I don't think it's zero, but I do think that there are more players on Georgia's roster right now who, in the next four <laughs> years, will be making appearances on Sundays than there are on an XFL team. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would favor Georgia. Not you by get, a lot, but I would favor Georgia. Because you get. Uh, you know, you're going to end up getting maybe a handful of XFL players who play their way into an NFL roster spot. And uh, that's not the case with the Georgia Bulldogs. There's a higher conversion rate. You know, there's there's a future show idea we should put in the dock for later this summer. Uh, when the XFL releases like it's all conference team, let's have a draft. The four of us will draft teams between Georgia's roster and the all XFL first team. And we'll, we'll, based on how who we draft, we'll get a much better idea which teams we think are better. Um, I like that idea. All right, let's go. This one's a little bit sort of widespread. I'll, I'll give you a second to to digest this. This is from the live chat again. Thanks to everybody for hanging out. Uh, go ahead and throw your questions in there. Uh, this one says, "What's a coach slash staff slash school?" that gets a lot more respect in the coaching community than from fans? Uh, easy answer here for me, Iowa. Mm, great answer. College football fans do not respect Iowa's coaching staff at all. You just go on social media during an Iowa game, and that will quickly become apparent. Other coaching staffs have a ton of respect for what Iowa does. I mean, and the NFL does too. Mm -hmm. And part of it's just for what they do, but it's also because like, if you are – if you're if you're a coach and you look at what they've been able to do there at Iowa as far as the longevity, the career aspect of it, a lot of respect for being able to hold a job for as long as they have and be able to keep doing it consistently and performing at the levels they have. So while maybe they might not have as much respect for the schematics of the offense, for the staff as a whole and for what they're doing in the program the Hawkeyes are probably the ones of coaches that I know. That's the one where I think fans, the difference between the way fans look at him and other coaches look at him would be vastly different. I'm, I, I'm going to describe something and maybe you can help me with like a big 10 example or something that's maybe a little bit further, you know, out of my exact expertise. But one thing that I've consistently picked up from coaches is how fondly they speak of tenures in places that are just good to live. And it's a great yeah. reminder of, the human aspect of this being a job and when you have to uproot your family and you do land somewhere where um, the schools are good, you know, it's a good place to live. And a lot of that comes with coaches who are, you know, a little bit more in, in who have families, kids, you know, and are in, a little bit more interested into the community aspect rather than some of these, you know, 
single bros or you know somebody who's perhaps uh you know, run it running out without too much to tie them down you you hear great you hear fond um reminiscence when some of these coaches and their families move to college towns that have good infrastructure even if the team is like a mid-tier power five team even if it's a team that only wins like you know six to eight games a year but the quality of life was great that's that's the one spot where I would say that you hear coaches talk more fondly about some jobs than the fans necessarily would. Is there a Big Ten example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I haven't heard it from him himself, but I, I'll make the strong assumption. Luke Fickle had a chance to coach at a number of Big Ten schools. The opportunity to live in Madison played a big role in Luke Fickle taking Wisconsin. Because, I mean, I know... He's got a large family, a lot of Catholic schools in the area, and that is was very important to him. But I just think moving his family from where they've lived pretty much their entire lives to another town, where the opportunity to live plays a big role in a lot of it for coaches. But that's probably an example for me right there because Madison, very nice place to live. Gets kind of cold and snowy in the winter, but it is still a very, very nice place to be. Yeah, that's, that's one thing that always is a, a nice reminder of sort of like what – these coaches are doing because we always break down the X's and O's and the recruiting and we grade them by the performance, but they also often have families and children and, and you know, other people to be concerned about that may or may not make a certain, uh, certain place look more attractive. I'll tell you what Gene Chizik didn't start angling his way to get back to North Carolina just because he loves the Tar Heels. No, nope. that, man, that man loves Chapel Hill. Mm-hmm. He loves Chapel Hill so much. Quaint yeah, little college town. Nobody really bother you. Nice, easy, affordable living. It's good yeah. stuff. And like, you know, like access to like airports, all that kind of stuff. Like you could be in a, like the town could be nice, but if it's in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> that's going to impact. If you have a family, that's going to impact if you want to move your family to it. And then on the flip side, like Los Angeles could be daunting. Yes. As, as an assistant coach or as a, you know, understanding yes. that you're going to have to go and I, if you're an assistant, are you going to get paid enough to even be able to make ends meet, especially considering the cost of living out there? So I'm saying like, if I'm, if I'm a, a very, like a GA or a very low bottom, just starting my career, 25 grand a year is going to go a lot further in Starkville than it will in LA. Yeah. But airport. <laughs> so we need to find the sliding scale to uh to make everything line up perfectly all right let's go back to the big old bag of mail uh this question comes from msw excellent podcast and a must for co hardcore college football fans question when the acc's future is discussed their terrible long-term tv contract is always brought up do you have any sense about how much the ACC could command relative to other conferences if they were able to renegotiate their deal? Would they be closer to the SEC and Big Ten or the Big 12, Pac-12? Seems like they have a lot of well-known brands, lots of TV markets, but only a few top-flight programs with rabid fan bases. They'd be bigger than the Big 12, but they'd be closer to the Big 12 than they would be the SEC or Big Ten. 100%. I've got, I don't have a, huge like pushback on that i recognize that the big 12 the big 12 making more money than the acc is a reflection of that deal mm -hmm. and i think that that's what leads to a lot of the consternation um which by the way north carolina athletic director bubba cunningham this week at the acc tournament has added his support to the florida state and clemson um caucus of we need unequal revenue sharing so Expect that to be a, a big topic of conversations when the ACC has its spring meetings in May. I don't know if we'll have any announcement coming out of it, but something to note, still, even if the ACC were to go to market with its current membership and get a brand new deal, it would not be in the same neighborhood as the Big Ten and the SEC. Right. Can we get like a like a sound like a sound effect of like a funeral dirge for every time we start talking about the ACC, we could just start playing that because man, but no, I, I think if it went to the open market, yeah, they would get enough that they'd be getting more than the big 12 right now, but kind of just along the lines of what you were saying, unless there's another 20 year grant of rights, they wouldn't be getting nearly enough to keep Florida state, Miami and North Carolina from sniffing around those SEC and big 10 waters. 
Mm-mm. I I 100% uh, agree with that. Let's go back to uh, the live audience. Let's keep it in the ACC. Why not? If, if Tom's going to bury this conference, let's get in as much as we can. <laughs> how would you rate how Pat Narduzzi has done at Pitt? Prior to him, the program was a mess under Dave Wonstadt, Todd Graham, Paul Christ. Since he took over, he has the second most wins in the ACC behind Clemson and always plays a tough non-conference schedule. Uh, I think Pat Narduzzi's done a wonderful job at Pitt. And I think this is one of those examples where it gets kind of lost in this national title or bust kind of just zit guys to the sport now where you look at a coach who's gone to a program like this and he has built it into, you know, I, I, I know Pitts won national titles in the past. I know it has that kind of history, but the 1970s were a long time ago. We're talking about the 2020s now, but this is a program that made the transition from the big East to the ACC. And I don't think it was a disaster under Chris. I think that was, you know, the program was literally making the transition from the Big East to the ACC at the time. It wasn't going to just be step in and be good right away. But Narduzzi came in after Chris returned to Wisconsin, and he has done as good of a job and better than you could reasonably expect for where the program was and where it's probably going to be. And I, I know I mock him all the time just for some of his approach to offense. Like we were mocking him all last off season. Cause he got, he was happy. The offensive coordinator that helped get a quarterback to the Heisman ceremony and them to an ACC title left because he threw the ball too damn much. And it's funny and the jokes are there, but they went nine and four. They didn't win 11 games again, but they still won a bunch of games. They were still one of the better teams in the ACC. And that's just what Pitt is. And you look at these kind of, mid-tier power five programs that probably aren't going to be competing for national titles going back to the previous question about coaching staffs that other coaches respect compared to fans pat narduzzi and pitt staff would probably be up there is like in iowa in a similar situation where they win games they're not competing for national titles but it's a good program and you know what you're going to get and they're going to play hard and they're tough to beat so yeah, that whole staff. I mean, it's not all that different from what D'Antonio did at Michigan State, where Narduzzi came from. They just had don't they haven't gotten a playoff berth out of it, but they have, you know, gotten to an ACC championship. A couple things are really impressive to me. Number one, this is his first head coaching job. Mm -hmm. He has been the head coach at Pitt for eight seasons. He has only had um one season below 500 that was in the 2017 season he has finished in the top 25 twice he has made the acc championship game twice he has won one acc championship he has delivered in six out of eight seasons finishing in the top three in the acc's coastal division division mm -hmm. plays obviously out the door but as we re-rack the acc in terms of overall power in terms of stability Pitt is more stable than Miami. Pitt is more stable mm -hmm. than Virginia Tech. Pitt football, as we enter the divisionless world, is a top four, top five program, and maybe top three, top four program in the entire re-racked ACC football world. And that is because Pat Narduzzi, in his first job as a head coach, has imprinted a philosophy and a culture that has sent players to the NFL. It has delivered a consistency. They are always competitive. And I, I think that the, uh, that should not be overlooked. And to your point about the national championship or bust Pitt can be a top 20 team as it has shown in the last two years, but it is, it gets a little difficult to argue um, in the abstract is like, is this a top 20 program? Mm -hmm. It's closer to 20 than it is to 40. Yes. And I think that like Pitt in that sort of 20 to 40 range has something that a lot of other 20 to 40 range programs don't have, which is real stability and just a level of consistency that a lot of those other programs and fan bases of those schools would love to have if they could. Yeah, every every coach at every program talks about culture, talks about identity and, you know, that kind of just the coaching buzzwords. Pitt is an example of a program that has a culture and an identity and it sticks to it. It knows what it is and it's successful. And again, that's, if you're not going to win national titles, that's pretty much the goal. Yeah. It's uh, have you ever visited? Or have you? Uh, no, I've not been to Pitt. I mean, I've been to Pittsburgh, but I've not been to Pitt. 
I have always wondered if there's something about um, sharing the same building and space as the Steelers that allows a program to take on a business like, you know, go to work kind of mentality that mm -hmm. you're just around professionals a lot. And that can be a contributing factor to a team that goes out there and just seems to go to work every day. Yeah, and there's a similar ethos between both. Oh, yeah. Very good point. And it matches the uh, matches the city uh, as well. Coming up on the other side, we continue with more questions from the big old bag of mail and live audience contributions next. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast. Uh, this one's a little bit of an emotional pro a problem that has been brought to our attention. Uh-oh. It's time for, time for guys to be sensitive dudes. Guys being dudes. Here we go. Brett asks, I'm a CFB sicko. I watch football for 12 hours on Saturday and the weeknight games when work allows. From September to mid-December, I'm locked in. This makes dating difficult for almost four months. I've told my past girlfriends that I'm all theirs for the rest of the year, and most weeknights in the fall, they get really annoyed when autumn rolls around. This is a, a serious five-star review question, by the way. We're not pl planting this at all, I'm, I, but it needs to be answered. I feel like me giving them eight months of the year is a fair trade-off. Any advice? <laughs> Um, you got to decide what you want, bro. Like is, is college football more important to you than your relationship? Or do you want to have a relationship with a human being? Because I can relate to as chip can as well to not really being available for a few months a year on weeknights and on weekends and just saying goodbye to the family for as much as you possibly can. But you and I, we get paid to do it. Like, like, I don't know if 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 Lynn would be as accepting of the way I am during college football season if I was just doing it to watch. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, uh, what I've what I've seen uh, out in the wilderness from my most sicko friends is that you're just very thankful that we've got the technology that allows you to track games and even watch games on the fly. So, you know, you can be out and then maybe, you know, sneak a, a possession here, be able to do a little score check right here and and feel like you're connected to the day without being absolutely glued to the couch. That said, you need to take advantage of this technology that allows you to get out there and multitask just a little bit. That is my advice, Brett. It can't be an all or nothing. If you're going to really be about it, You've got to learn how to create some balance there. You can't shut the door uh, to your office or shut the door to your TV room and say, no one bother me for 12 hours. You got to identify the schedule. And I think that even sometimes Bud does this a lot uh, when we're breaking down games on the show. He's like, identify the TV windows where it's like, you know what? If I need to give four hours to a girlfriend or a family or something like that, this this one might be the way to do it. So that's what I that's that's kind of I think the way you got to go. But also say, if not, if you would rather watch football than spend time with her, maybe she ain't it. <laughs> I'm just saying. Like I'm not I'm not saying forget her because you know we all have needs that we sometimes need addressed. But I'm just saying. If I would, if you would rather be watching Toledo and Kent State on a Tuesday night than chilling with her, think about what that says about you and her. Sue, in the live audience, I'd never date a guy who didn't watch CFB for 12 hours on Saturday. All right, Brett, Sue, y'all find each other. Let's hook it up. Sounds like. Sounds like the Cover 3 podcast not only has its own uh, search committee and search firm, sounds like we are also matchmakers as well. There are there, there, there are men and women out there who She's any man or you. woman you could just gotta date. Find her. Yeah, you just got to go find her.
And just, if she's not into it, then she probably ain't the one. Oh, this is it's good. My girlfriend wears my bowling green jersey during midweek maction. She understands we can go apple picking on Friday. <laughs> there you go. See, it's the soulmates are out there. Everybody has one. You just gotta find it. And you know, just don't ignore the signs. <laughs> Yeah, cover three wedding coming up. We'll uh we'll we'll I'll, I'll come officiate the wedding and uh and and, do and it. Welcome, <laughs> back. welcome back to the wedding, wedding ceremony. <laughs> oh man. Let's see. Uh yeah, we can do that. What about Justin asks, what's the best option for Oregon and Washington if the TV deal turns out extremely low? Uh, I mean, it depends on the TV deal. Um, extremely low, like lower than the Big 12. I mean, if it's your only option, that's your best option. Like if I, I know there's been speculation about like the Big 10 offering them like half for a few years before making them full members. If that if that's your best option and it's more than what you're getting, well, that's your best option. But is that offer there? So I don't know. It's it's kind of a weird question to answer, honestly. Um, and then one last one. This one comes from Houston. It says, "Hey guys, I love the show and listen all the time. Y'all have quickly become my go-to podcast, and I enjoy all of your insights that I would never be able to have." Here's my first question. I live in Central Texas, and I was wondering if there's a possibility that the Baylor Bears are a New Year Six contender this year. If not, what is the cap for Coach Aranda and his once promising team? Parentheses. That is my main question. The second one is less important. Is there anything you would alter about the new CFP? Also, what is your first non SEC Big Ten school you could see winning the new playoff? Thanks so much and appreciate all that you put into the show. So let's start with the Baylor piece. What is the Baylor cap? Because when we have discussed um, a lot of the new Big 12 and you know reminded fans of what we're going to be looking at, and we've talked about Texas and Oklahoma potentially in the mix for bounce back type seasons. We did not mention, we have not talked a lot about Baylor in 2023. What is your expectation for Baylor? What is the cap for success? For Baylor in 2023, I I don't think you're getting to the playoff this year or New Year's Six Bowl. It doesn't mean I don't think they could have a successful season. But one of the things that's like we have to we have to learn because again, the Big 12 in recent years, we knew everybody was playing everybody. They played a round robin schedule. Now we have to look at their schedules. We got to see who catches breaks because you know who Baylor's not playing this year, Texas. No, they no, play Oklahoma. Texas at home, but they don't play Oklahoma. So that's that's a boost to your schedule. But I just – Baylor, what, they won 11 games in 2021? Mm -hmm. They went 4-1 and one in one-score games that season. Last year, they dropped to 6-7. and seven. They went 2-3 and three in one-score games. So that doesn't explain the entire drop-off, but that's two wins right there in kind of coin flip games. And I think Baylor had the coin flip go their way a lot in 2021, so they – overperformed what they probably were and last year the coin flips went against them and they underperformed so i think realistically you look at that program and they're probably somewhere between 11 and 6 i would say 8 and 4 regular season kind of but the non-con they've got utah coming to town so at least it's in waco but utah not exactly a pushover of a team that's going to be a tough game they get texas to open big 12 play they have to go to ucf they have to go to cincinnati they got Kansas State and TCU on the road back to back late in the season. It's it's not the most difficult Big 12 schedule. It's just I don't think Baylor's at that level where I can expect it to win all of these coin flippy kind of games. I, and I think a lot of these games are mostly going to be coin flippy situations. So I think they're good. I think they're going to be better than last year, but New Year's Six Bowl probably not realistic. Yeah. It is a team that has found both success and frustrations at the absolute thinnest of margins, including the fire drill field goal to mm -hmm. TCU, including having your quarterback knocked out and still nearly winning at West Virginia. You lose that game by three. You, you mentioned the overall one score games. You go to double, double overtime against BYU because Baylor's roster right now is not going to overwhelm the rest of the big 12 with talent then you are honestly like 
I'm, I'm putting the microscope or the spotlight back on Dave Aranda because you are trusting Dave Aranda and the coaching staff that he has assembled, which by the way, just made a change at defensive coordinator heading into 2023. You are trusting Aranda, the staff, their preparation, the way they handle game day to be able to help you win at the margins because where Baylor's roster is has to win at the margins to make a new year six bowl to make a run at a big 12 title. It is not impossible as Aranda already showed in his second season as head coach, but it is not a smart bet. It is not something that I would, you know, come out and um, come out and recommend as a, as a best bet. Seems like a lot more of a, if you got a, a nice like long shot, maybe you want to say Baylor because we think that this is a team that you know was right there in so many games that we flip a couple of them and all of a sudden we get a much different result. But as it stands now, heading into 2023. I think the ceiling's probably top four, top five in the Big 12. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's a good program. It's better than it was last year. What was the second part of his question, though? Oh, um, the second part of his question is, uh, who will be the first non-SEC, non-Big 10 team to win the expanded playoff? Non USC or oh, non SEC, oh. non Big Ten. Okay. Um, Florida State. I like that. Mike Norvell got things moving in the right direction. I, I mean, I, I, if Bud and Danny were on the show today, no way in hell I pick it. But since. <laughs> Since they're not here, Florida State. I'll go Oregon. Dan Lanning gets it done. There we go. We will be back Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. So make sure that you subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that notification so you know right when we go live, youtube.com slash cover three or wherever you get your podcast. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Tom, thank you very much. Thank you. Also, Michael Campbell, what the hell top 25 of mine are you talking about? I don't have a top 25 out. <laughs>